Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to, the, to today's webinar, The Cloud Helps Manufacturers Change with the Times, led by renowned industry analyst and founder of Mint Jutris, Cindy Jutris. My name is Amy Horgan, and I am the Marketing Events Manager at Plex Systems. Plex Systems organizes webinars and other activities like today's event to help manufacturers learn more about cloud technology and how it can improve their performance. Our webinar programs are an extension of our mission to help manufacturers implement best practices and achieve excellence across their enterprises. With that, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. With more than 35 years of manufacturing experience, Cindy Jutras has worked specifically with manufacturing companies, analyzing their technology needs and the impact of enterprise applications. Through her firm, Mint Jutras, she has been ben benchmarking the performance of software solutions. She is the author of the book, ERP Optimization, and numerous magazine articles and research reports. Cindy, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Amy, and, and welcome everyone today, um, wherever you are, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening. Um, so glad to be here, one of my favorite topics. Um, you know, our topic here is about how cloud ERP can help manufacturers keep up with the times. I don't think I have to tell anyone here that we're living in a world of change. Um, but among those changes, what I've observed lately is the attitude towards ERP, enterprise resource planning. You know, it, it, particularly for manufacturers, it used to be viewed as a necessary evil. Um, those running manufacturing organizations in charge of production, in charge of delivering to the customer would always have rather spent any budget that was available on on something that would help them actually produce more product. Something like a machine on the shop floor, maybe labor, um, you know, additional headcount. Um, not necessarily a back office system that they didn't necessarily see the direct value for. That is changing. Now, part of the reason it's changing is because ERP has been changing and it's far more robust, um, easy to use, fully functional than it's ever been in the past. Um, so that those in the know today actually see the value in better planning, better collaboration, whether you're collaborating internally or externally through the supply chain or with suppliers. Um, more visibility, all of this actually does help them produce more with less, less physical resources. Um, yet still some manufacturers today are reluctant to, to sink the time, money, and resources into something that they might feel has an indirect value more than a direct value. So I'm here to, to try to help change your mind if you're amongst those. If you're not amongst those and you really do need to, to make a step forward, um, then hopefully you'll still find some of the data and some of the information that I share with you today valuable. Let's start with how those times are changing. Um, you know, it's interesting. Before I became an industry analyst back in 2006, I spent 30 years uh, working for software companies. From 1984 to 1994, I was in a pre-sales position. I was the one that went and did the demos of software to manufacturers. Um, as part of that role, I probably did a plant tour every week. And then, you know, when I left that role, my plant tour days were, were kind of uh, few and far between. A couple of years ago, um, I did a, I did a, I spoke at an executive forum, about 25 top level executives. Um, part of that forum was, you know, some activities. And one of the activities was a plant tour at a Harley Davidson plant. Um, followed by a, a pretty cool trip to the Harley Davidson Museum. But as I was going through the factory, I thought, you know, it's been probably 20 years since I, I was in, uh, 25 years since I did plant tours regularly, but in a way, a lot hasn't changed. The way they were communicating um, throughout the plant floor, it hadn't changed all that much. But there was one thing that struck me. It's like this picture. I looked around and said, where are all the people? And 
you know, I didn't see a lot of people. I saw robots. I saw machines that that were two stories high. I saw saw a lot of activity, but I didn't see a lot of people. And yet, and yet, parts were and and um, transmissions in that case were being produced at a at a very high clip. So a lot of people have been blaming the loss of manufacturing jobs on offshoring and outsourcing, and I am sure there's a there's a lot of that that happens, but probably even more relevant is because of all the automation. What used to be done by people is now done by machines. Now, what's interesting is this point gets missed a lot, and part of the reason it gets missed a lot is that automation was the the initial purpose of that automation wasn't necessarily to eliminate jobs. The purpose of the automation to begin with was to add, to remove the variability from the production process. In other words, to in improve the quality, um, the predictability, the consistency of the manufacturing process. So, so those jobs didn't go away right away when the automation was introduced. But in the 1990s, the early 1990s, when times got pretty tough, guess which jobs were the first to go? Those jobs that had been eliminated by the automation. And when a recovery happened several years later, those jobs never came back. So yes, there's people out in manufacturers. A lot of you work for those manufacturers. You know darn well that there's people out there. But what that means is that the pro average profile of the person that works in a manufacturing organization has changed. It's much more of the knowledge worker than the commodity of an assembly line kind of, uh, kind of skill. As a result of that, the people that are using ERP um, has changed. And, you know, it's not just the heads down data entry people worrying more about getting data in, but it's also the people that are trying to get data and information out to make data driven decisions. Um, so in this respect, it's changed what's being expected of ERP as well as added to that level of expectation. Now, there's some other changes that are happening in the environment, too. There's a new competitive landscape out there. The world is shrinking, and it's been shrinking for years, um, but it's shrinking more drastically now. Um, new markets are opening in emerging economies, but that's also creating new competition. There's new competition arising from sources that even as much as 10 years ago you never would have thought would be there. Those same low country, the, the countries where you got low cost sources before are now springing up as competition. So it's changing that landscape in that regard. Now, in competing with those emerging companies in the past, you used to only have to compete on a better quality because these were new to manufacturing. They were probably a lower quality, but that's improved over time as well. So now, you might have to look for different ways of differentiating yourself besides the normal price, delivery, and quality. At the same time, customers are becoming more demanding. They want shorter lead times. They want it when they want it, exactly what they want. They may even get involved in the design process. So the customers are becoming more demanding and you're, getting, you're faced with competition from a lot of sources and because of all this this demand, um, you're forced to do more with less. So the question we're here to answer today is, what role does the cloud play in facilitating those changes? Now, before we get into that, we have our first polling question today. Um, now, you're, you're given several options here, and you can only pick one of them. I know some of these might, um, more than one might pertain to your company, but pick the, the one that best describes how many employees have access 
to ERP at your company? Is it only a select few at any time? You know, maybe between time zones, a different set of, of concurrent users um, take over. When you run out of users, someone has to log out in order to let someone else on. Or do you only have a few named users? Only Sally or Dick or Harry can actually get on, and, and you can't afford too many of them. Um, is it pretty much all those that enter transactions but few others? Maybe a supervisor here and there. Um, how about all that are entering transactions and those that are making operational decisions, maybe frontline managers, maybe everyone except the top brass, or maybe a few of you, everyone including the top brass. So you've got another few um, seconds to select what makes the most sense in um, how best describes the access to ERP in your company, and then we'll wait a few seconds to get some um, instant, instant gratification here and find out how you folks all ask it. Um, oh, gee, unfortunately, most of you didn't answer the question. Um, so maybe we have to wake you up. <laughs> um, so we don't have too much here to go on in terms of how many employees have access in your companies. Um, fortunately, we have some data from my surveys. So let's move on to that. So we asked the question, and I do an annual ERP survey every year, and and I asked the question this year, what percentage of your employees use ERP. Now, years ago, not too many years ago, that number would have been probably half. It would have been in the 20%. Um, but it's been growing over the past few years. The way I cut the data here, was, though, is interesting, though. Um, what you see in the dark box are those running a SaaS, software as a service, cloud application. And all other are using typically a traditional on-premise model, but they might have a hosted solution or something like that. Um, bottom line is there's a, about a 44, 45% differential in terms of the percentage of the employees that are connected to ERP when they're using a SaaS um, deployment option. Um, Part of the reason why is the ability to access it anytime, anywhere, with no footprint on your own device. So, you know, you, you might be, all you need is a, a, an internet connection and proper security to get on there. I think this is an indication that the worker profile has changed. You get more knowledge workers, you get more, more um, decision makers that are actually touching and feeling ERP today as opposed to using um, a surrogate or a subordinate to get their questions answered. Now, this, this webinar really isn't about Plex systems, but given the data you're going to see on the next slide, I couldn't resist showing you um, this next piece of data. Um, Plex systems actually <coughs> provided the survey that we're talking about here the survey link to their customers, and we got quite a good sampling. Um, we had over 80 responses from Plex Systems customers. So this is quite, quite revealing in that, uh, as you know, Plex Systems only provides a SaaS solution. Um, so it even beat the average of the other SaaS users that participated in our survey so that on average, 73% of the employees in a company that's using the Plex Cloud um, actually has access to ERP. Now, I should point out, too, this is not the casual user who may only get onto a solution, say, to record their paid time off or um, enter a purchase requisition. These are actually real users of ERP from a day-to-day -day um, situation. Now, the other thing that we've noticed in looking at this and seeing how this has changed over time is that we're seeing a higher level in the organization actually putting their hands on ERP. Five years ago, we probably wouldn't have had any executives actually putting their hands touching ERP. Didn't have time to figure it out. 
um, didn't necessarily have interest. They were perfectly happy to have someone else get their questions answered. Now, here's our next polling question, and in this case, I hope more of you will participate in this. It doesn't take much to participate. Um, just click the button um, when the question comes up. But we're asking, are top executives connected to ERP at your company? Um, you know, and this goes from, no, they don't have time to figure it out, um, that's what they have me for, to not now, but the more they carry those tablets around, the more they want, um, to we're starting to see some getting into it, but they mostly want pictures, dashboards, charts, and graphs. Um, you might have at least some executives with limited access to ERP, and the final is all executives have access and regularly use ERP. So you've got 15 more seconds. You've got about um, half the time, a few more seconds. Please select um, A through E um, for your company. And then we'll hold off a minute. Um, hopefully you'll have, we've got a little more participation this time. Um, and then afterwards I'll show you what the results were from my survey. So wait just another minute. And, and quite frankly, I'll give you a little hint too, is, as you might notice from this, um, you can see that, that mobility tablets and smartphones are probably having some aspect of it. So in, the, in this case, we, we had a little more active participation, about half of you. Um, and, and it's good to see that, that almost all of you that answered um, your executives have at least limited access to ERP. Now, I would venture to say that had I asked this question five, ten years ago, um, those numbers would have been reversed. There might have been one or two where e executives were putting their hands on, on the system. Um, today in my survey, um, it's a very different landscape. Um, and again, those with SaaS deployments are much more likely to have the executives participate in the ERP user community. Um, I think those mobile devices are making them less patient for waiting for answers. Um, in many cases, it's a portal, it's a dashboard that may be drilling down to more information, um, but that's far preferable to those decision makers rather than, you know, what happens today? A lot of times they get, alert on, they get alerted to something on those mobile devices and then they turn that smartphone into a dumb phone and they call someone to start the investigation. With more access directly to the, the application, they get more impatient for the answers, but they also are better equipped to get those answers. As you can see, in a SaaS environment, it's, um, it's about 84% um, at least have some limited access to ERP um, compared to 77% in a non-SAS environment. And let's look to see how that compares to um, those running the Plex Cloud. In this case, the percent that have access directly jumps up to 95%. Um, so as you can see, um, this is, or infer from this, that the cloud ERP, a SaaS environment, makes it easier and or more conducive for those executives to touch, feel, stay connected, and get those answers immediately. So we won't bother you again with another question, but um, hopefully you won't fall asleep and you'll continue to, to pay attention here, even though we're not asking you for another question. Okay, now, as more employees are accessing ERP, um, one of the things you need to be prepared for is that that will generate the need for more functions, um, more features, et cetera. Um, this is indicative, our data is in, indicative of this as well, because here we're showing some of the, the modules of ERP that aren't your core basics of accounts payable, accounts receivable, general ledger, inventory control. Everyone needs those. They ever, everyone needs to have some sort of back office system to control that. But when we get into some of these other modules, 
um, for, quite frankly, not everyone needs all of these. But what we saw from 2011 to 2013, and that wasn't a full two years, um, between the two surveys, it was about an 18-month difference, we saw a very significant jump in the actual deployment of some of these modules. Why is that? I think it's because more and more are looking at it, seeing more value and demanding more of their systems. For example, you know, if you're looking to differentiate yourself um, beyond the usual of price, um, delivery, and, and quality, then you may have to do, differentiate yourself, for example, by providing a service that you might not be able to get from those low-cost competitors. So that's driven the need for additional aftermarket service. Um, if, for example, you need to produce more with less physical resources or with the same, produce more with the same resources out on the shop floor that you have today, then you need to do a better job of at enterprise asset management, whether it's preventive or whether it's um, repair work. Um, if, you, if your customers are demanding shorter lead times and yet you can't afford big buffers of inventory, you may need to consider distribution requirements planning. You may need a better handle on supply chain planning or better supplier collaboration. You know, the, the old infinite capacity kind of scheduling may not do the trick anymore. You may have to deal with finite scheduling, project management. Um, as you can see, the, the percentage increase um, is, is a little less as you get further down this list. But if you're not running these kinds of modules, if you're not demanding that from your system, then you may be losing your competitive edge as well. But if you need more functionality, if you need a more robust, more fully functional kind of solution, um, then, then, you know, you may be thinking, well, we may not be able to afford it. In this case, cloud truly can help. Um, first of all, it's easier to pay for. Um, you know, you can do more for, for a lot less cash um, because you're not paying for it up front with a big fee. Um, yes, there's a recurring subscription payment, but oftentimes you can absorb that as an operating expense versus a capital expense. And it's not unusual. If, if you're capital constrained today, you're not alone. Um, and in fact, credit, even though it's loosening up some, still isn't exactly easy to get. So that whole operating expense versus capital expense, quite frankly, in the 2008 to 2010 time frame, I believe that reason alone can attribute a lot to the fact that a lot of people started looking at these cloud or subscription-based offerings more often um, because um, they were capital constrained. They could make a big jump in terms of their performance and a big jump in terms of operational support without making a big capital outlay out front, up front. Now, it was in that 2008-2009 time frame that we started to see a lot of this interest in cloud and software as a service come to play. Um, you see a lot, you can't pick up a magazine today if you do pick up a print magazine. A lot of us are relying online for a lot of it. You can't look at your digital news feed without seeing a lot of talk about cloud and SaaS. So in that regard, you might think everyone understands it, but I didn't really believe that. So back about a year ago, I launched a, um, another kind of survey, and this was about understanding SaaS, software as a service. And it was meant to understand how well the folks like yourself on this webinar um, actually understand 
the different definitions and the different ramifications of accessing over the cloud and software as a service. And a lot of people use those terms interchangeably. I find myself using them interchangeably as well. Um, but in fact, the definition of cloud and the definition of SaaS are two somewhat different things. So in this survey, um, I actually started off by defining them like this. Cloud refers to access to computing, software, storage of data over a network, generally the Internet. You may have purchased a license for the software. You may have installed it on your own computers or those that are owned and managed by another perhaps hosting company. But the access is through the Internet and therefore through the cloud, whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud. So that's cloud. SaaS is short for software as a service, and it's exactly what's implied by the acronym. The software isn't delivered on a device, on a CD, or anything else. It's only delivered as a service. So it's not loaded onto your own computers. You don't license it per se. And it's generally paid for on a subscription basis and doesn't reside on any of your computers at all. So if we define it this way, then we know that all SaaS is cloud because it's accessed over the Internet, but not all cloud is SaaS. So just keep those in the back of your mind. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the results of that survey. That survey was not only meant to get a sense of who understood what, but also what those preferences were and what value was perceived in moving to the cloud. So there are some that will argue that everything is going to be SaaS or cloud, and, and it's going to happen very quickly. I don't believe that it's going to happen that quickly, and the numbers here prove my theory out. Now, a couple of things. First of all, the question was, what percentage of your business software so that includes ERP and other application software as well, CRM, PLM, you know, a whole slew of three-letter acronyms. What percentage of your business software is SaaS today? What do you anticipate in one to two years, in two to five years, and in five to ten years? So many of my counterparts, pundits, industry observers, would like you to believe that everything in five to ten years is going to be SaaS or cloud. Um, first of all, it, more of it might be cloud than SaaS, but as you can see, um, less than half will still be SaaS within five to ten years. A lot of that has to do with how many solutions today are already installed and already in traditional on-premise licenses. And for cloud and SaaS to happen, a lot of times those need to be replaced. Now, the other thing you're noticing here is that I'm comparing manufacturing and distribution companies to all other industries. The reason I do that is because sometimes manufacturing in particular gets a bad rap. Um, manufacturers are accused of being laggards in terms of adoption of technology. Quite frankly, I think that might be true in terms of information technology. I don't believe it for a minute that it's true in terms of technology that, that manufacturers use to, um, to run their businesses. Remember that, that picture I showed you before about automation and technology, but a lot of times that technology is used out on the shop floor versus in the back office. What this is telling me is that manufacturers are not going to leave, are not going to lag in terms of moving to software as a service. In fact, they're going to lead. I'm not surprised by this for the very reason that, that manufacturers might be reluctant to spend money and resources on those back office systems. They're perfectly happy to have someone else who, where it's not their, you know, man, this is not a manufacturer's core competency. They're, they're perfectly willing to allow someone whose core competency it is to manage these systems, take that over, outsource it, um, maybe not offshoring, but at least 
manage those processes. Um, so as you can see, I believe manufacturers and distribu distributors will lead the way in terms of SaaS business applications with ERP um, coming right along with them. So in light of that, in my ERP survey for the past few years, I've been asking the question, if you were to choose an ERP solution today, which deployment options would you consider? Now this is an are you purchasing, that was another question, but which ones would you consider if you were purchasing today? Again, the difference between 2011 and 2013 here was about an 18 month period. We've seen those that would consider SaaS growing over the past few years. And sure enough, it grew incrementally from 2011 to 2013 from 45 to 48 percent. We'd seen a bit of a dip in terms of hosted in the past few years, um, but that's recovering. And in fact, I would, I would venture to say that, that, um, the software as a service numbers there are understated because I honestly believe that a lot of business users don't necessarily or can't necessarily tell the difference between a SaaS solution, a SaaS delivered solution, and an ERP hosted and managed by your ERP vendor. Um, the reason I say that is remember I told you a lot of Plex customers took this survey, not every single one of them said that they would consider a SaaS solution, even though all of them are running a SaaS solution. But would a, would a business user that doesn't know how the system was delivered or, play or paid for or deployed know the difference between hosted and managed by their ERP vendor or a SaaS solution? Maybe not. Um, so as you can see, there's a strong interest in that. But it's this right-hand one where I have it circled in red that shocked me. And going from 2011 to 2013, those that would consider traditional licensed on-premise solutions dropped off a cliff. That reduced in half, um, dropped by more than, into less than half. Um, so this is where obviously the the perceived value of a cloud solution and alternative deployment has really, I think, is, is on the cusp of becoming mainstream, but it's, like I said, just a question of those replacements happening. So if those replacements happen, what do you have to do? You have to consider return on investment of a replacement. You have to cost justify it. So. The steps you need to consider, if, you, if all you want to do is take the benefits of a cloud solution, chances are you're not going to be able to lift and shift your current solution onto the cloud. There are a few vendors that, that do provide that as an option, um, but largely mainstream, you're, you're looking at a replacement. So you need to understand the options, you need to cost justify it, and obviously need to commit the resources in order to make that transition. So what I'd like to do today is help you understand how you may be able to cost justify it. Now these survey, re these savings um, were as a result of the ERP survey and I've been asking these questions for, for years. Um, what I ask and the way I phrase this is um, what was the reduction in operating costs, administrative costs, inventory costs, obsolete inventory, since you implemented your ERP. I used to years ago ask as a result of ERP, um, but that confused people because we all know that it's not just the software that results in these savings, but it's also the people and the processes in combination with the technology. So it's much easier for someone just to put it a line in the sand when they start the implementation and today what savings you've realized. Now you're seeing the difference between world class and all others and this year that world class was a top 20% in terms of performance. This is not a world class company. I'm not sure how to actually define a world class company. There's a lot of different ways I could define it. 
This is a world-class ERP implementation. So it's based on the results that have been achieved since implementing ERP like these. It's progress against goals, and then I throw in some current performance metrics because, quite frankly, if you suck badly enough, you can make a lot of progress and still suck. So pardon my uh, blunt language. Um, so I throw that in as a, as a way to, um, to make sure that a world-class ERP implementation really is world-class. As you can see, these are relative. So these are not absolute numbers. I can't tell you exactly how much you are going to save, but you know what your operating costs are today. You know what your administrative costs, your inventory costs are. If you don't, and how, you know, however you define them in terms of what you include in operating costs versus administrative costs, obvious what inventory costs are, obviously what obsolete inventory is. If you could just take 10% of your operating costs and take that off, um, off your, your bottom line, what savings would that represent? It's going to be a different answer for each and every one of you, but a 10% reduction is pretty good. You double that to 22% and it's fantastic. So these are, these are people that actually measure these things. And if you're not measuring these things, I would say that you should be. Um, these are not esoteric kinds of things. Now, how you cost justify may vary from this. These are pretty general. I would guess inventory costs are always going to be a factor. But you may pick out some element of operating costs. You may pick out some element of administrative costs. But I would bet if you do this right, you can point to very, very significant savings. Now, all of those, now each one of these could be enough to justify a move. All of these cost savings are very internally focused, though. What if you look at externally focused kinds of improvements, though? These are more customer-facing kind of improvements. And again, we ask the same question. How much were you able to improve complete and on-time delivery um, as, since implementing ERP? Um, you improve complete and on-time delivery, and I guarantee you will improve your customer retention. And that was defined as the number of customers that do business with you from one year to the next. Reduced cycle time can help you with complete and on-time delivery, can also help you with the customer retention because, let's face it, lead times demanded are shrinking. Whether you can respond to that or not may be, may be determined how, how well you perform. Um, what if you could increase your production without increasing the kind of physical resources that are on, on the um, shop floor? That comes from better planning, better collaboration, better forecasting, better scheduling. So finally, we're nearing the end here, and, and I'd also like to cycle back to that um, previous survey that I talked about, and that was um, understanding SAS. One of the things we asked was people to put these different per, um, perceived benefits of SAS in order of importance. So the number on the top, it was, you know, from, from um, one to five, and five meant it was the most important, and four meant it next, and three meant it next important. Um, as you can see, cost factors were the most important perceived benefit of a SaaS solution. And that's so far what we were talking about in terms of cost justifying the solution. But the second most important is in terms of upgrade issues. Um, you know, a SaaS solution can provide you with more innovation. In a traditional on-premise solution, um, you all probably know how that gets innovated, how it gets upgraded. You know, the, the vendor schedules a release every 12 to 18 months. They package it all up. They test it. They go through a beta cycle and they release it. It doesn't get consumed as fast as it gets developed. And that's a 12 to 18 month period. In a SaaS solution, um, the software vendor can be updating it much more frequently than that. Now, that's probably going to be 
vary from SaaS vendor to SaaS vendor. And if the SaaS vendor is also offering that same solution in an on-premise environment, that may limit how quickly they can deliver that innovation because they're still limited by their customer's ability to consume that upgrade. Part of the reason they're limited by the customer's ability to consume the upgrade is we all know that, that upgrades can be disruptive. Um, now, the use of disruptive and disruption today is somewhat overused. You hear a lot of, in, a lot of my counterparts talking about disruptive technology, and they're talking about it as if it's a really, as if disruption is a really good thing. There's two kinds of disruption. Disruptive technology helps you do something that you couldn't possibly do without it. It changes the way you do things for the better, hopefully. So in that regard, disruptive technology is a good thing. Disruption to your business, in, in my book, is no matter how you describe it, is a bad thing. Disruption to your business means you can't produce product, you can't ship it, you can't invoice it, you can't collect cash. That kind of disruption is not good for anyone's business. Now, if you relieve yourself of the, of having, of the burden of the upgrade, then you take out a lot of that disruption from the upgrade process. Now, a lot of people are concerned by the fact that in a SaaS environment, you sort of lose control over when you get upgraded. Well, that could be fine. I, if all of the innovation is delivered in sort of an opt-in manner, you don't have to turn it on until you're ready, then who cares when it gets updated? Wouldn't you want it updated all the time so whenever you're ready to turn that on, you can? Now, not every single SaaS software provider provides that kind of benefit to a SaaS solution, so make sure you dig deep and find out how and how often um, that upgrade process happens in a SaaS environment. But if a SaaS provider can provide more innovation, completely opt in and relieve you of that burden of it, you can get far more innovation kept up to date much more frequently with far less disruption to your business. So let's just summarize. You know, manufacturers really need to change with the times. You know, we're we're all struck with with more automation. Um, that means less people, but it means things are happening that much more quickly. We're seeing competition from all over the world in places springing up from places we'd never have considered it coming from in the past, um, and it's becoming a much more competitive environment. Um, and you need to keep up with that. But let's face it, how many manufacturers out there are not capital constrained? You, but at the same time, you need to, you've always had to compete on price, delivery, and quality. Today, you also need to compete on your connectivity, your collaboration, your responsiveness. So this adds another whole dimension to how you need to keep up in the world. And that adds another whole dimension to what's required from your back office systems. Cloud ERP can help. It can lower the cost of entry to actually getting more um, and better solutions. It's easier access. You don't need, you have no footprint on whatever device you're accessing ERP from. And more and more today, it's not just a desktop, it's not just a laptop. More often, it could be a tablet, it could be a smartphone. Um, it can help you connect at a higher level in your organization. It can make your executive more impatient for answers, which can drive him directly to the source of the data, as opposed to going through a lot of intermediaries. Cloud ERP definitely has the upper hand when it comes to keeping upgraded. 
um, and being able to to expand the footprint of functionality that you'll need um, in order to keep up with more demand by having a different profile of user, higher level profile of a knowledge worker, higher levels in the organization. Bottom line, it can let you do a lot more with less and it can help you keep up with the times. With that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Amy to see if we have some questions waiting. All right. Thank you, Cindy, for a great presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to the Q&A portion of today's session. Some of you have already found the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you haven't, um, that's where you can submit some questions for Cindy to answer. So we'll get started with uh, the ones that we've received during the presentation so far today. Uh, Cindy, um, given a cloud-based solution, shouldn't I be concerned about the security? Huh. You know, that, that that's a good question because, you know, part of my um, research always asks not only the perceived benefits of SaaS, but also any lingering concerns. Because, you know, in reality, for many years, um, ERP was the last bastion of resistance to cloud. Um, and many of the concerns were around security. What I would say is if you're concerned about security, you should be. But quite frankly, everyone should be concerned about security, whether you're running something on premise, whether you're running something on the cloud. Obviously, we live in a very um, internet enabled, connected world, and that produces some level of vulnerability in terms of outside access to your data. Who's better? able to protect that data, someone whose very own livelihood depends on it, a cloud provider, a SaaS solution provider, someone who makes a living at protecting that, um, or a small to mid-sized manufacturer who may or may not understand the ramifications of IT security. Um, I would say that a SaaS solution probably provides you better security because it, 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 there's redundancy built in, there's business continuity plans built in, um, and, and as, a, as a small to mid-size or even a large manufacturer, you may not be very well equipped to handle those kinds of potential intrusions or invasions, but a SaaS service provider can. Ask that SaaS service provider to provide you with statistics in terms of outages, in terms of anything like that. Um, and anyone worth their salt should be able to give you all their stats um, and, and assure you that, that your data is safe with them. Uh, here's a question we received around upgrades, or you know, innovation upgrades. How often do they typically happen? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Are they disruptive, like a Microsoft update? <laughs> well, that depends a lot on the SaaS solution provider. Um, there, as I mentioned before, you know, the potential for more innovation is definitely there. Um, not every SaaS solution provider can take advantage of that, that potential. If you have a solution provider that can provide, that does provide a solution in a non-premise environment and in a SaaS solution, um, then chances are they're limiting, they're li it's sort of the lowest common denominator. They're limited by their on-premise solution. Now, there's, there's some intrinsic benefit in being able to go from on-premise to SaaS and from SaaS to on-premise, although, to be honest with you, I haven't seen a lot of companies do that, although some perceive that as an advantage. However, if you're in a pure SaaS environment, then chances are the SaaS solution provider is going to be providing updates much more frequently. I would ask that question. Um, if you're talking with the Plex, the Plex folks, you're going to get a very different answer, um, and it's going to be far faster than a lot of their competitors. That's one of the things that I've noticed is uh, 
quite a clear differentiator when I've looked at the Plex Cloud versus some of the other um, solution providers out there in terms of the frequency. Um, I, you know, some people might be concerned that it's too frequent, but if you're concerned about that, talk to some of their customers because most of their customers don't turn those new features on every day um, or every time they're, they're delivered. They're still going through their own cycle to determine what to accept and what to turn on and what not to. So it can, that can be done as frequently or as infrequently as you'd like. So it can range anywhere from updates every day to updates every 12 to 18 months. Ask those questions. Okay, great. Now here are some questions kind of regarding software licensing pricing as it, when it comes to a cloud-based solution. So you seem to imply that a cloud solution is cheaper, but after paying several years, isn't there a break-even point in terms of buying the software? If all you look at is the software cost and the recurring maintenance of a traditional on-premise solution, there will come a time when there will be a break-even, yes. Um, where you save is, number one, startup costs, and where you save even bigger is on hardware and the maintenance of the hardware. Um, you could save on IT staff, but you don't necessarily have to. The reason I say that is if you have IT staff, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to get rid of them or need to get rid of them. What you want them to do is play a more value-added strategic role in your company than the ongoing day-to-day -day care and feeding of an ERP system or anything else that's, that's run on a SaaS environment. So there's a lot of different sources of cost savings besides the actual software cost and the maintenance. It's it's when you only look at those two that you come up with that kind of a break-even point. Okay, great. Uh, another kind of pricing question. Uh, what is to prevent a cloud solution vendor from raising the price in the second year? Um, contract. <laughs> this is, you know, it's, it's um, look at your service level agreement. Um, because that what that's what's managing the the relationship between from a legal standpoint between you and and the software vendor. Um, some of the SaaS solution providers will actually um, build that right into their software their service level agreement. They will without you even asking um, guarantee that they won't increase it by more than a certain percentage. Um, Others um, might not be built in, but if you ask them about that, um, you can negotiate that in. So protect yourself. Um, if you're worried about that, um, then make sure it's written into the fine print of the contract. Okay, great. So now the last kind of question, and this is something I think we all at Plex see very often, this question. What if I don't have reliable Internet service? You know, that is probably the one um, factor that would prevent me from recommending a, a cloud solution to you. Um, fortunately, there are fewer and fewer places like that in the world, but if your internet's going down every day for a little while, or even once a week, um, then perhaps it's not for you. Um, that is the one requirement that I would see is that you know you are going to be dependent on that internet connection, and if you can't rely on it, you know that has nothing to do with the SaaS service provider. It's whoever is providing that internet connection to you. Um, that has to be there, um, or I would you know I would recommend that you stick with something that that is not a SaaS or a cloud-based solution. Okay, great. Well. I think that's it. That wraps it all up. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, we'll be following up with you um, after the webinar to, to, to respond to your questions in more detail. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for attending today's session. And thanks again to Cindy for discussing how top cloud technology helps manufacturers change with the times. We hope you all found today's sessions useful. If you want to learn more about how cloud ERP can help your business, take a look at our Knowledge Center on the website plex.com. You'll find white papers, case studies, and more information at that link, all free for your reference. 
In the next couple of days, you'll be receiving an email from Plex with a link of today's recording uh, for the webinar so you can go back and view it again later. After we conclude this webinar, a very brief survey will pop up with a few questions about today's presentation and the kind of information that would be valuable for you in the future. Please complete the survey so we can continue to bring you useful and relevant topics. Thank you again for your participation. We look forward to, to talking to everyone again soon.